We have just a few announcements before we begin this morning. The first one is that there will be a coffee hour today via Zoom from 11 till 11.30. So please join us for fellowship at that time. The second announcement I have is that the, the book study on the N-Word begins this Thursday at 12 p.m. and goes to 1 p.m. and will wrap up the following week. So please join us. If you haven't read the book, take a quick read and join us on Thursday at 12 p.m. The church will be reopening on October 4th, which is World Communion Sunday. So please come if you feel comfortable and join us in live worship here in the sanctuary or join us live online via Facebook. Either is an option for you, and please do whichever option makes you feel safe. Also on Sunday, October 4th, we will have the blessing of the animals. And this year, that's going to take place in Central Park, which is directly across the street from the church. So bring your dogs, your cats, your mice, your fish, or whatever animal that you want. All are welcome. Please invite your neighbors and friends to participate also. This is not just a park church blessing of the animals, but it's for the town of Newark. So if you have people who have pets that they want to bring, please invite them to come along. Social distancing and masks are required to attend this event. And now please take a moment to center yourselves and your mind and enjoy the music, Lord Prepare Me, as you read the reflective reading from Psalm 105, verses 1 through 5. Our announcement before we continue in the service, I wanted to let you know that this service was pre-recorded on Friday morning, so we invite you to still participate and to log in and greet each other and say hello and whatnot, but I just want you to know that the service was pre-recorded in case something happens in the world that's not mentioned in today's service between now and Sunday morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Draw near to the Lord who hears our pleas and our praise. We come to rest in God's holy presence. Here is bread that the Lord provides. Here is manna to nourish our souls. We gather to feast on God's sustaining word. Remember the Lord's wonderful works each evening. See God's glory with the morning's light. Come, let us worship the Lord. Let us pray. O God, who knows our every need before we ask, you provide all our needs and some of our wants. You bless us. Make us truly thankful and empower us to bless others from the gifts that you have given us. For the glory of your name, amen. Oh, 
Jesus singing Praise for the morning Praise for the spring Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Lord, your generosity surprises us, for you do not meet out grace according to how hard we work or how often we worship or how closely we follow the rules. No, you lavish grace upon us according to your own desire. But we insist on deciding who is deserving and who is not. We grumble that some receive too little while others have more than they deserve. Forgive us, we pray. Help us to live with humility and gratitude so that our words and deeds might embody your grace. People of God, our sins are forgiven. We are reconciled to God. Let us therefore love one another with gratitude in our hearts and praise on our lips. Friends, it is through Jesus Christ that we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Holy Spirit,
Let us pray. Let the wisdom of your word rain down on us like manna and feed us, that we may be strengthened to do the work to which we are called, for the glory and honor of your name. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Matthew. Chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. Listen for the word of the Lord. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. After he agreed with the workers to pay them a denarius, he sent them into the vineyard. Then he went out around nine in the morning and saw others standing around the marketplace doing nothing. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I'll pay you whatever is right. And they went. Again around noon, and then again at three in the afternoon, he did the same thing. Around five in the afternoon, he went out and found others still standing around, and he said to them, 
Why are you just standing around here doing nothing all day long? Because no one has hired us, they replied. He responded, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the workers and give them their wages. Beginning with the last ones hired, and moving on finally to the first. When those who were hired at five in the afternoon came, each received one denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they, when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner. Those who were hired last worked for one hour. And they received the same pay as we did, even though we had to work the whole day in the hot sun. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I did you no wrong. Didn't you agree to, uh, didn't you agree that I pay you a, a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I want to give to this one who was hired last the same as I give to you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with what belongs to me? Or are you resentful because I'm generous? So those who are left last will be first, and those who are first will be last. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth And the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Our reading this morning is actually a continuation of the discourse that Jesus began in the last half of chapter 19, where a man approached Jesus and said, Teacher, What good things must I do to have eternal life? And when he asked, Jesus replied, Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you want to enter eternal life, keep the commandments. And Jesus went through his list of commandments to the young man And the young man replied, but I've kept all these. What am I still missing? And Jesus replied to him, if you want to be complete, go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away saddened. He was saddened because he had so many possessions. How could he possibly give all of them up to follow Jesus? While the story doesn't tell us what the young man did, he most likely failed because he couldn't sell all that he owned to just hand over the proceeds to the poor. If we were to take these parables literally, we might be asking ourselves, is this fair? In biblical times, a denarius was a silver coin equating to one full day's labor. And we just heard that those who worked one hour were paid the same as those who worked a complete day in the hot sun. Most of us might agree that that doesn't seem fair. I venture a guess that we might get ourselves worked up if we were asked to give all that we owned and sell all of our possessions and hand the proceeds over to the poor. How many of us would truly consider that? Or if we were asked to double or triple, work, working double or triple the time, than somebody else and receive the same pay in our own jobs. Would we do that? Some of us might say that that would be crazy to do that. 
But the parable this morning is not about a fair wage, and it's not about just compensation. The parable goes against what many of us would say is just and fair. We might even go so far as to say that it really isn't all that logical. When we read these parables, we need to step back and realize that Jesus is seeking to help his listeners understand the kingdom by using analogies and symbols that they can relate to. Our parable this morning is not just about God and his generous gifts. It's also about God's grace. This week in my reading, I read a story about God's grace. And in the story, it told about Mayor LaGuardia, who was the mayor of New York City during the worst days of the Great Depression and all of World War II. He was called by many New Yorkers the Little Flower because he was only five foot four and he always wore a carnation in his lapel. He was described as a colorful character who used to ride the New York City fire trucks. He would raid speakies with the police department. He would take entire orphanages to baseball games. And whenever the New York papers were on strike, he would go on the radio and read the Sunday funnies to the kids. One bitterly cold evening in January of 1935, the mayor turned up at a night court in an area that served the poorest ward in the city. LaGuardia had dismissed the judge for the evening, and he took over the bench himself. Within a few minutes, a tattered old woman was brought before him, charged with stealing a loaf of bread. She told LaGuardia that her daughter's husband had deserted her, and that her daughter was sick, and her two grandchildren were starving. But the shopkeeper from whom the bread was stolen refused to drop the charges. It's a real bad neighborhood, your honor, the shopkeeper told the mayor. She's got to be punished to teach others around here a lesson. LaGuardia just sighed. And he turned to the woman and he said, I have to punish you. The law makes no exceptions. Ten dollars or ten days in jail. But even as he pronounced the sentence, the mayor was already reaching into his pocket. He extracted a bill and he tossed it into his hat, saying, here is a ten dollar fine, which I now remit. And furthermore, I'm going to fine everyone, everyone in this courtroom, 50 cents for living in a town where a person has to steal bread so that her grandchildren can eat. Mr. Bailiff, collect the fines and give them to the defendant. The following day, the New York City newspapers reported that $47.50 was turned over to a bewildered old lady who had stolen a loaf of bread to feed her starving grandchildren, 50 cents of that amount being contributed by the red-faced grocery store owner. While some 70 petty criminals, people with traffic violations, and New York policemen, each of whom had just paid 50 cents, gave the mayor a standing ovation. Here's my question. Did the elderly lady in the story get what she deserved? Of course not. She had stolen a loaf of bread. She had a good reason to take the bread, but still, she broke the law and had to be punished. What we see in this story is called grace. Grace is, was, is when one in superior power shows kindness or mercy to one 
in a lesser position. Grace is receiving what we don't deserve, unmerited favor. Mayor LaGuardia, rather than demanding punishment of the woman herself, paid the fine. That is just what God did for us. We were guilty and had to be punished, but Jesus paid our fine. It was more than she deserved. It was grace. That is what our gospel text this morning is all about. In this parable, Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner that went out and hired workers for his vineyard. So he hired early in the day, telling them that he would pay them their usual wage. And as we know, he continued to hire throughout the day. And at the end of the day, just like he said, all were paid the same wage. Some may say that the landowner didn't know much about how to run his business. For the next time he needed laborers, nobody would come until the end of the day. What the landowner did know a lot about was grace. The landowner showed grace and mercy to those who only worked the last hour of the day. Who knows who those people might have been? They have, may have been the elderly or the people who were disadvantaged and couldn't actually work a full day. Of course, the landowner in this parable is God. The workers are us, and the pay is the kingdom of heaven. Charlotte Gleenhorn reminds us in her writing that this parable is not about fairness or equality, but it's about God's love and it's about God's grace. It's not about equality or proper distribution of wages, but about a gracious and undeserving gift. It's not about an economic exchange, but rather about a bestowing grace and mercy to all, no matter what time they have put in or how deserving or undeserving we may think them to be. God's generosity often violates our own sense of right and wrong our sense of how things should be if we ran the world? Are we unable to celebrate another's good fortune because we have not celebrated our own? How often are we ungrateful for God's graciousness and mercy? How often do we deny God's love and forgiveness in our own lives? Jesus leaves us with a question. Can we learn to see through the eyes of God? Our ideas of right and wrong, of what is just and unjust, are not necessarily God's ideas. And that's a very good thing. We are reminded by this parable that the tables are turned. When we look for equality, in equity, we are surprised to find generosity. You and I are invited and challenged to look at where we see ourselves in Jesus' parable this morning. This parable reminds us that God is a lousy bookkeeper and invites us to transform our pride, our envy, and hardness into joy by admiring and celebrating God's astounding generosity and grace. It's time to have a self-check moment. Do we find ourselves envious of another's gifts, talents, abilities, possessions, or social status? How often am I or you envious of others' good fortune? Envy can cause us to, to diminish our own gifts and talents and secretly to rob others of theirs. 
God is the giver of every good gift, whether it's ours or someone else's. Are we willing to share the joy of others' gifts that are received from God? Are we embracing our own gifts from God? The parable calls us to look at ourselves honestly and lovingly as God looks at us. It invites us to turn around from holding grudges because things did not go our way. It invites us to let go of the stuff in our lives that keeps us from being joy-filled and grateful people. God's grace is about mercy, and it's not about fairness. God freely gives us his love. We don't earn it. And at times I even wonder if we deserve it. This is going beyond fair, to be merciful. And that is what God's grace is about. So this is the good news that I'll leave you with today. God's grace is received, not deserved, nor earned. Secondly, God's grace is about mercy, not about fairness. And lastly, God's grace is just as much for the first as it is for the last. How can we share God's grace and God's mercy in the world? And does it always have to be fair? Amen.
people this morning our call and response. I will say, Lord, in your mercy, in the responses, hear our prayers. Please type your joys, concerns, and thanksgiving into the screen so all may hold them up in prayer. Let us pray for the needs of the world, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, who hears our cries and pities our groans, you are ever faithful. We come to you with our petitions for ourselves and for the community. We pray for our church and its leaders, that they be of open mind and open heart, that they might be the Christian leaders that you have called them to be, and that the church be an instrument of your love, of your justice, and of your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our country and the global community, that all may be peaceful, fair, and respectful of all people, no matter the religion, color, gender, or kind of government. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our local community and for all that are in this community who strive hard each day to help one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also pray, O oh God, this morning for those in our society that are overlooked. We pray for the poor and the young and the old and the oppressed. Help us to see them and to be with them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We continue to pray for Thurlow Hammond, who is recovering from sur surgery, and for another member who's for good wishes for a good outcome in a disability hearing. We pray for all the prayers that we hold on our hearts and that we give to you now in this moment of silence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious and loving God, we know that you hear us. And we know that you are always with us. And we thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. And let us now say the words that Jesus taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Great is God's mercy towards us. Let us take a moment to offer a portion of what God has given us with humble and grateful hearts. You can do that through the website or by mailing your check to the office. And friends, now rest in the knowledge that God always provides. Therefore, give and love with a gracious heart. For this honors God who is most generous and loving. And may God continue to bless you and to keep you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.